Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habita fillah Continuing our study of a nasiha by Shaykh and Shaykh Ibrahim Rahili hafadhallahu ta'ala and we were talking about the Dhuwabit al-Hajr we were speaking about the Dhuwabit al-Hajr the the criterion for boycotting someone and what we said prior to this, just as a review, uh, one of the things that are important is, is learning that a lot of these major masail, these major issues, they are built upon looking at the musalih wa mufasid. They're looking at the harms and the benefits. And this is what differentiates Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah from many of the groups of Ahl Bid'ah. And that includes those who are extreme. Uh, whether they be takfiris, whether they be uh, people who make tibdir excessively without the right to do so, is a lot of times that people think things are just black and white. And I'll give you some examples before we get into the treaties. One example, I recall when I first came to Saudi Arabia many years ago, uh, a brother that I loved and, and had respect for, and I considered him a, 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 a bit of a teacher for me because he knew more and he stayed in Damaj. You know, when I left, he stayed there. He stayed there and he got some years in. And he was here in Saudi Arabia for a time. And I went to visit him in one of the cities and stay with him for a few days. And what I recall, because of his lack of knowledge, plain and simple, uh, the way that he was trying to apply those duavit, and he was under the spell of a certain group of brothers in the UK, may Allah forgive us in them and guide us in them, who uh, had a lot of ex extreme characteristics and really a lack of knowledge in uh, many of these the Wabit. They just took aspects of the Dawa, Dawa to Ahl Sunnah, and the principles of the Salaf al aspects, but not going into deep into those Masail and studying because some of the brothers just didn't have the favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to go and seek knowledge. And this shows you, Habitavillah, the importance of, of true talib al -ilm. I don't mean just that you've gotten to a strong stage because we know people, I know people personally who studied, got years and years, I'm talking 15, 20 years in, in seeking knowledge. They're on a whole nother level, way beyond myself and probably that I'll ever get, especially as far as memorization and things like this. But did Allah favor them with fiqh fideen? Because you see that they make some such basic elementary mistakes with regards to some of these messiah. You wonder, what were you studying for all those years? 15, 20 years and you sat with some major scholars even. What did you learn? And this is a big problem because and what distinguishes us between uh, a, a, a lot of Ahl al is that you'll see that they don't, they don't have, for example, the Takfiris. They just make Takfir. Look at Faisal. And I, I'm going to keep mentioning it. I guess since it hurts their followers, I'm going to keep doing it. And my, my purpose is to make clarity for the people, is not to talk about this Takfiri person, uh, you know, as a means of attacking him personally, but it's more because of the deviance that he spread. And it was open deviance. It wasn't like something behind closed doors. We have tons of tapes and his few books and things that he did of his uh, many lectures. And we see that the effect has been amplified over the years, that there's still people who follow this individual. So he must be warned against and the, the deviance must be warned against. And the point is, is that you'll see that these takfiris, that they make takfir without these dhuwabit, without criterion. They don't look at, for them it's black and white. For them, they see something, they believe what someone is ruling, but other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, so they make takfir them. They don't look at any of the duaba and criterion that Ahl Sunnah has. And I'm talking from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi all the way back to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala ibn And they do not look at uh, many of the, uh, the, the other aspects, and all of this is knowledge-based. And that's why the Prophet said, مَنْ يُرَدَ اللَّهُ بِخَيْرًا يُفَقُوا فِي الدِّينَ Whenever law wants good for a person, he gives them understanding of the religion. Understanding fiqh fiddin is not simply memorizing and it's not simply sitting in durus. That's not it. But that fahm, that fiqh, 
that only really comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allahu bihi khayran. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them some fiqh of the deen. Because there are some people who have fiqh for deen, but they haven't memorized much. And there are some people who have memorized mountains, and they have no fiqh for deen. You have all kind of extremes. And so, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with fiqh for deen, and to understand that these issues are very sensitive issues, and that when you apply them, you need to apply them based on knowledge. And if you don't have the knowledge, then don't, don't attempt to involve yourself, especially something as, as cutting off a, another Muslim. This is very serious. So we reach the principle where our Sheikh, he said, uh, the fifth principle, and we talked about it a little bit last time, and we're going to catch up to speed. He said, which should, also be, which should also be emphasized here is that the refutation, so here he's talking about refuting people and refuting individuals, especially ref, refutation between Ahlul Sunnah, that the refutation should be commensurate with the degree of propagation and prevalence of this particular infraction. If it has spread in a particular locality or community, it is not recommended to hasten with refutation, but whether by way of written compilation or cassette tapes or any other means of propagation. This is especially true in a locality where people are not familiar with the fallacy or infraction being refuted. So basically what the Sheikh is saying here, for example, to give an example of this, uh, as I mentioned prior, I'm from a place called Seattle, Washington. And there, we have a lot of students of knowledge. We have a lot that have went, a lot favored, especially from the Cham community and Somali community. We don't have many native speakers that have been favored to go abroad. But we have brothers, and these brothers have grown up there. So they are, they know the society, and they, they have a lot of uh, benefit to offer, most, most of them. And... The issues that they busy the people with aren't the same issues you would have in a place, for example, Brixton, or in America, Philadelphia, or maybe a community in Washington, D.C., or a community that is a, a reverts in Atlanta or something like this. The level of exposure to the ulama, the level of exposure to a lot of masail is different. So if you were to bring an issue and you start making divisions between the people by saying, you know, this person is Hadadiyya. And the people have no idea. They're just basic Muslims trying to practice. They, they respect anyone they see who's on the mimbar. You need to approach them with a different approach, enlightening to them about uh, the Sunnah and warning them away from uh, a, a bid'ah. But if that bid'ah is something which is not, you don't even find it there, you're not going to bring that up to the society. This is the point. And we gave many examples uh, prior to this. We said the issue, for example, which was happening in the uh, probably the late 90s and early 2000s, the issue of when the division of uh, Sheikh Abu Hassan Ma'rabi, who I believe has innovated in the religion of Islam. You know, he has, he has some bid'ah. And Sheikh Rabi has written extensive, compiled extensive, uh, extensively about his, his mistakes as well as many other ulama. That doesn't mean we take every single issue and we say, yes, the Sheikh was correct in this and Abu Hassan was correct in this or incorrect in this. No, you have to look at those issues <coughs> based on the issues, based on the knowledge, not based on the individuals. My point being is that did this, in, this, did this, uh, did these Messiah need to be spread everywhere in the world? In issues where the people don't speak the language? In the issues where the people have never even heard of him? In the issue where the people are not affected even by his methodology, his minhaj, his, his mistakes, uh, his akhta minhajiyah? W is that necessary? Would it be necessary for me to bring that and translate the problems that are happening in the Arab world with this individual and in other places where the Dawah has spread would that be appropriate to bring that to Seattle? The answer is no, because the people are not even aware of that. They've never even heard his name. They don't even know who the, the Mashaikh that are against him. They may not even know who the major scholars are. They're not even dealing with that issue. They don't need those issues even. They don't even need uh, to be involved in that, but rather they need what is munasib, what is useful for their society. And this is the point. You don't bring fitna 
of one place and just spread it around the earth just for the sake of spreading it and for the sake of taking a position. And so what happened is there was many individuals and I told, and I've mentioned this story uh, prior, a particular individual that I know who's Salafi and he used to be Sufi. I remember when he was Sufi and I remember when he was Tekfiri, when he was running with, and he was a, a follower of Faisal. I remember that. And Allah favored him to be guided to the methodology of Ahl Sunnati with Jama'ah. And so he told me that when he first became Salafi, he was in an East Coast community. And some individuals approached him. They said, Salaam Alaikum, Ahi. You know, and basically one of the first things they said to him, what's your position of Abu Hassan Ma'adi? He said, well, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I've never heard of him. And you know what they said? Ma Salama. And they just left him. So they made, they, they tested him with Abu Hassan Ma'rabi and the individual doesn't even know anything about him. He doesn't, he didn't know Arabic so he couldn't even get involved with whatever mistakes and it's not just knowing Arabic language but even the Messiah that Abu Hassan made mistakes in. He didn't even, he had no uh, involvement in that affair and it was not applicable to his life at all as a Muslim. But however, they made empty hand, they made, they tested him and boycotted him based upon that. So that shows us what? Adam of Fiqhfideen, that they lacked knowledge of the religion. They lacked understanding of the religion even. Both. I would say it was a combination of both because most of the people didn't really know. Most of us were just blind following whatever we heard and whatever was translated for us from the websites. Most people didn't know because a lot of people, not very many people have been favored to go and do some talib al-ilm. So with that being the case, the point is, is you don't bring a fitna and you don't test the people and you don't cut off the people based on something that has no relevance and they know nothing about. The Sheikh then says, he says, in this case, circulating the refutation in an indirect matter, manner is more preferable. Because if it is direct, people may possibly come across it, and the fallacy thereof is not convincing enough, and it remains in their hearts. So here the Sheikh is talking about the fact that if you bring some of these refutations out to the people who have no idea, and it doesn't affect their society, it doesn't affect their community at all, that you may be reviving or introducing that bid'ah, and you may not have the strength to refute it. So for example, if I get on the mimbar, I go back to Seattle, and I start talking about Tekfir, and I start talking about something related to Tekfir that the people uh, uh, are unaware of. You know, that they don't really know and it's not really useful. And I start talking about the doubts of Faisal, for example. But the people are not even affected by his da'wah or, or, or even this issue. Perhaps, maybe my da'wah would be, my, my knowledge and my argument would not be so strong. And I may introduce the bid'ah of Faisal. And his argument may be more convincing. So I think that that's clear. That's a clear example of how that can happen and the danger. That's why it's very important to deal with the people. And this is the way of the Rabbaniyun, of the, 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 the people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises in the, in the Quran and the Rasikhun of Al-Ilm. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises in the Quran that they start the people, as Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala said, they start the people with the small Masail before the big ones. You know, it's Rabbani because Rabbani, the, what comes from that word, uh, uh, what evolves or uh, a, a, we call it sarf in, in Arabic, but what is, uh, what comes from, what is derived from that uh, same word and that same terminology is the word tarbiya. So we say, Tarabba uh, or Yarabbi, Yatarabbi or Tarbiya, all of these are uh, uh, coming from the same word. Tarbiya means education. So it shows that a part of education, you don't start with the major issues and then all of a sudden you start learning about some basic issues about Tawheed meaning basic issues of Tawheed, oh, there's Allah is one, he's the only one worthy of worship. You don't know any of that. You come as a Muslim, but you're learning about the, the criterion for tikfir. No, that's not how, uh, that's not the way in the minhaj of the Rabbaniyun. 
So the Sheikh then says, he says, so leaving the people intact and free from hearing the falsehood to begin with is better than bringing it to their attention and then trying to refute it afterwards. The Salaf used to consider this point carefully in their refutations and many of their books, which are specific to refutation, they use the truth to refute falsehood without even mentioning the fallacy initially, which is from their profound understanding of the religion and its objectives whereas some of those who came after them have become ne very negligent of this. Just as it is said about spreading the reputation in a locality where the infraction has not been propagated, the same is said about not spreading it amongst a group of people who are unfamiliar with the infraction or mistake, even if it is in the same locality in which the mistake was made initially. In short, it is not appropriate to propagate the reputation by way of books or cassette tapes amongst the laymen who are, ob who are oblivious to this mistake. So that's very important for us to understand, is bringing the people the knowledge that they need in order, you know, you build people, and that's how we build our Islam. Many of us were not blessed to build our Islam that way. Instead, we were busy with major messiah and major issues and we got involved and some people even left Islam because of this and others went to bid'ah because of this and others spirits were broken because of this all kind of fitna and this is what I recall even when when Faisal's tapes were first being uh, spread in my locality the individual who brought this uh, that you know, it was so c confusing because a lot of us were new Muslims. And so a lot of the brothers, they embraced that because they were from the streets. You know, brothers coming from gangs, prior gang life. So that sounded cool, a, a way to roll on somebody. You know, they liked that. And others, you know, were, you know, everybody had a different lifestyle they came from. And some, it just sounded so pretty on their tongue, the espousing of violence and the, the, the need to make takfir and call scholars munafiks and scholars for dollars and all of this kalam. But it was way above their le level. None of them, I can promise you, that even had sat and finished a book in Tawheed. I mean, I'm talking a small book, nor did they even know of a book in Tawheed. They knew that Allah was one. They knew that they should direct worship, but they really didn't know ibad, ibadat. They didn't know, and they had no fiqh ibadat. They had no fiqh fi I mean, even I'm talking the basic issues that every Muslim should know. Many of us didn't know. Because our first books were Sayyid Qutb, Milestones, and then the tapes that Faisal was circulating. That's what the brothers were exposed to. And then later it was Abu Hamza, Misri. So this is the tarbiya. They didn't get those things which they needed to build themselves as Muslims, but they got major messiles from Ahl bidah even. So that's a, that's a double whammy, and it's a double way to go astray. Wallahu musta'an. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil until the next sitting.